again, all, all of those programs you should be signing up for. The only thing you literally don't have to sign up for are the evening, uh, the evening programs. So uh, anyway, but uh, tonight we have a, a kind of different look at a bird program with our favorite bird presenter, Will Broussard. Um, and he is going to be talking about birding for hikers. Now, I would say the majority of us get out there uh, hiking at some point, and uh, he's going to be telling us and uh, suggesting perhaps some of the uh, different birds and so forth that we would hear in different locations at different elevations and all of those kind of at different times of the day uh, and all those kinds of things. So. Um, I will turn it over to Will in just a second, but I do want to say if you have questions, please enter them in the chat and then we will take some time at the end to discuss them. Um, I'll read them out and then people can also unmute themselves and just ask Will himself about uh, any questions that he might have. So uh, anyway, um, all right, Will, I am going to turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank, thank you, you. Laurie. And thank you all for joining me. I see so many familiar faces. I miss you all. I am um, currently down in Brunswick, Maine, along the coast, along the, the um, Atlantic flyway here. So I'm getting some nice migrant action at being the last couple days in April. It's very exciting to um, to be here and, and to see everything come through. So as Lori said, this will be a kind of a change on what we have been kind of accustomed to doing on, on a lot of these programs. A lot of the times I'll focus in on just the warblers for spring and getting ready for our brownfield bog walks. Um, but as Lori mentioned, this is going to be a program that's more geared towards the different kind of natural landscapes of the White Mountains and what kinds of birds you can find in the, the specific area. So let me share my screen and we'll connect over to my presentation. So um, hopefully everyone can see that there. And so we're gonna gazed at this beautiful photo. And this is probably not unlike what we're seeing right now um, in the White Mountains. Of course, in this photo, this is probably another week or two out with the um, canopy trees greening up. But it's an incredible time of year to be out and about to see the alpine zone bright white with that rime ice um, and probably some snowfall as well, um, uh, uh, making the mountains appear white in contrast to the green foliage. So I like to use this um, animation here to get us started, to get us thinking about migration and how birds are not going to be, you know, in one place for the full year. This is um, kind of a composite image, satellite image of what the landscape looks like through the 12 months. And um, I just like looking at it just to just, just remind us that, you know, it's a dynamic planet that we're living on. Um, the landscape is constantly kind of changing through time. And if you were to focus especially on New England, you'll see that we live in this seasonal landscape. So we've got um, four seasons. We've got our winter, we've got our spring, summer, and fall. And of course, the birds that live here have to deal with um, deal with that. So I have some basics here kind of relating that natural history, that ecology to um, the birds of, of New Hampshire. So we have our native plant communities that include in the White Mountains anyway, the alpine, the coniferous, the northern hardwood ecosystems. We also have wetlands and I kind of lumped together a number of different smaller ecosystems into what I call open land. So pastures, orchards, kind of disturbed land and some of even those urban and suburban yard landscapes into the general kind of open land of um, of, of ecology speaking. And New Hampshire's more or less 300 native bird species have evolved to depend on these landscapes for survival, you know. So if you are thinking about wanting to help your native birds, one of the first things you can think about doing is uh, planting native plants. You know, all of these birds are depending on native food and native food for many of our bird species are native insects and native insects have um, de basically are depending on native plants for survival. So 
uh, year round hiking brings us into direct contact with a lot of these different um, plant communities and the birds that are there living out their life. And so at the end of the program, we'll talk about some uh, conservation solutions and um, uh, some wrap up thoughts. So uh, just some good um, kind of uh, general terminology here that we'll be talking about through this presentation. So we've got um, a number of different birds that call New Hampshire home that are here year round. These are our breeding resident birds. So birds like our downy woodpecker or northern cardinal. We also have wintering migrants, which um, we think of as birds that are just here in the wintertime, birds like our snowy owl and pictured here, the American tree sparrow. We also have breeding migrants that are here just in the summertime. Of those, we have the short distance breeding migrants like red-winged blackbirds and woodcock that come back a little earlier in the spring, maybe in March, early April. Then we also have the long distance breeding migrants. These are coming in right now and they'll be peaking in mid-May. Things like broad-winged hawk, red-eyed vireo. So these are um, kind of three subsets of the different kind of migration strategies we'll be referencing as we um, go through the talk. We also have birds like um, the common red pole, pine grosbeak, two species of finch that we get during eruptive years, years where the uh, cone crop in other parts of their northern winter range is not doing so well, so they will kind of erupt down into northern New England. And so some years you can get some massive flights of, uh, of different finches, including the red poles. Also passage migrants. These are some of the fun um, species that we really try to get after in the fall and the spring. These are birds that are just passing through birds that are breeding up in the boreal forest of the Arctic and are wintering down beyond um, New England and some even far as far south as South America. And so birds like our white crowned sparrow and even solitary sandpiper. And then you have the true nomads. These are birds that are following their food around and where the food is they will actually breed uh, birds like the red cross bill. And so we'll go through and we'll check out um, a few of these uh, uh, different species that we have in these different ecological zones. So I wanted to throw in um, this slide just to talk about some of those incredible migration journeys. Uh, the Arctic Tern, which um, breeds on just a, uh, about 10 islands off the coast of Maine, um, they will travel 12,000 miles one way in winter off of Antarctica. Um, just an incredible feat of migration. And so they're a bird that you can see in the summertime along the coast. And another bird that are a bit rarer than the Arctic tern is the northern wheat ear, a bird that actually nests up in the Arctic, um, northern Canada and northern Alaska. And um, they will fly all the way down to sub-Saharan Africa in, in winter. Um, down there. So it's pretty incredible. Um, the, the population that winter, that summers up in Alaska flies west over Siberia and down through the Middle East to Africa. But the population that lives up in um, Northeast Canada will actually come down a bit um, northeast of New England and fly over to the United Kingdom and then down through Africa uh, to get to the, the Sahel and the Sub-Saharan parts of Africa where they winter. So just an incredible 9,000 mile one-way journey for the Northern Wheat Ear. And then getting much closer to the White Mountains. Of course, we have the Black Pole Warbler. Um, one of the uh, longest migrating warbler species that we have, if not the uh, poster child for the longest warbler migration, especially for those who are uh, breeding in Alaska. This is a, a boreal songbird, so it's breeding from um, you know, northern New England and uh, southeast Canada all the way out to Alaska in the boreal forest. And this bird will fly 6,000 miles one way to Brazil, Venezuela, Ecuador, so um, northern South America. So it's incredible uh, journey that they that they go through. So we'll, um, we'll talk a little bit more about the Black Pole as we get into our program. Um, through this slide up just to get us uh, kind of acquainted again with where we are in northern New England at 60 degrees north latitude. We are in a kind of Goldilocks zone, a sweet spot of uh, seasonal climate. We're not too warm, we're not too cold, we're not too inundated with rain, we're not too dry. So we actually are very blessed with a seasonal temperate um, uh, 
environment. It's really a nice place to be. Uh, but if you go into the mountains of this part of the world, you will quickly realize that as you go up in elevation, it's as if you're going north into uh, the higher latitudes. So it's a, it's a really unique environment with very, um, I want to say definitive boundaries in between these different ecological zones, but that's actually not true. There are um, the kind of a blending of, of zones as you get up into the mountains, as you probably notice as you hike, you go from that temperate forest down in the river valleys, um, and then it blends into the boreal or what they're calling taiga in this um, slide. And then as you break up through the, the tree line and into the tundra, um, the landscape just changes dramatically. So we'll start up in the alpine tundra, kind of the the uh, the crown, uh, uh, the roof of um, northern New England of uh, New Hampshire, and this landscape is very unique. Um, it's one of the, the well, it's the kind of um, smallest of its kind. Um, in New Hampshire, you know, if you were to just kind of break out all the different ecological zones that we have, the, the Alpine zone is very small compared to, um, well, to, compared to other parts of the United States, but also compared to the different kinds of ecology uh, that you have in, um, in, in New Hampshire. It's a windswept, waterlogged landscape. It is a short growing season. Um, the plants that grow are very short. Um, they often um, form cushions or mats to hold in that moisture. They're often uh, thick uh, leaves. They're often evergreens. It's just a really unique landscape. Um, the birds that are adapted to this environment are often ground nesting. So this is an environment that doesn't have trees, tall trees to nest in. So birds are very much um, at home on the ground. So birds that we'll find up here uh, include the American pipit, white-throated sparrow, dark eyed junco and in the um, bottom image there you see actually an American pivot nest which is kind of like an oven shaped um, structure that's uh, nestled in those uh, alpine plants here. So um, I got this image actually looking back towards the summit um, the Gulf Side Trail kind of north of the summit proper of Mount Washington just this classic um, alpine landscape on a beautiful uh, probably a July day with the Cog Railway coming up the side there and this is a common bird um, that we that we see and uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play its play its call for us so um, maybe if uh, if Lori doesn't hear it she can um, she can speak up but hopefully we'll all hear it so I'm gonna play this bird's uh, call for us so when I hear this bird this is the the uh, common raven this is um, a denizen of these these you know really extreme windswept environments up on Mount Washington you see them all over the place and they seem to enjoy playing in the wind um, when I often hear them both on the summit and down in the valleys they often repeat that that croak call three times and that's for me um, when I hear that, it's just immediate. Oh, that's a raven. They do it three times, like awk, awk, awk call. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe it's the population, depending on where you are. Maybe they, they repeat it more times, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's dependent on, on where they are, but that seems to be how it is for me. And I'll play a couple other calls because they, they have a really, um, quite a range. <laughs> I'll play another. Um, so yeah, this is just a, a just an incredible bird to see up in the alpine zone, and you know you might see crows as well. Crows are smaller than our ravens. Um, it's important to look at their their tail. So the raven has the wedge-shaped tail, whereas the crow is more squared off. So that's a really helpful um, field mark for telling them apart. In the alpine zone, um, you'll actually often on migration see horned larks down in the uh, down running around. So this is a perfect environment for them. Um, you get them breeding along the coast of Maine uh, on some of the more sandy, exposed environments. Um, 
but you'll also get them up in the alpine zone um, moving through. And you know, as in, as uh, as hard as it is to believe in the windswept environment, there are snowy owls, and actually, um, I've had I've heard reports of snowy owls migrating through um, in November on their way on the way to their wintering grounds, closer to the coast and further down. Um, into the mid-Atlantic, you'll see snowy owls up in the alpine zone. I mean, it looks just like home for them. So it's a it's a great place to check for snowy owls, along with, you know, larger fields down along the river valleys um, as well. But if you're hiking in the White Mountains and you want to see a snowy owl, kind of the best time to do it is if you're um, uh, winter time hiking, or at least of uh, kind of shoulder season, oct late October, November, um, in the Alpine Zone. That's at least when when I've heard of um, my colleagues up on the uh, at the state park uh, and the observatory seeing them in the Alpine Zone. And then, of course, our American pivots that actually are breeding in the Alpine Zone. So that's a a great collection of birds to be to be thinking about when you're up there. Um, as I mentioned, the, the pipit is uh, a bird that's up there, but it's also on a couple other um, alpine summits here in New England, including up on Mount Katahdin. But you're not going to find them breeding, um, you know, in, in the Midwest uh, or much of the plains. You have to actually go to um, the, the Rockies and, and into those kind of um, alpine tundra locations to see them on breeding grounds. In the, in the lower 48 of the United States, you have to go up into uh, northern Canada and Alaska to get them on breeding grounds elsewise. So that's pretty, um, pretty unique to get this bird um, in the alpine zone. So when you're up there, it's fun to just kind of take note that, hey, this is a bird that I'm not going to see, you know, breeding um, on the east coast except for uh, in locations like this. So I added this uh, slide just to um, just to kind of show how as birds are migrating, um, many of them are coming, you know, into contact with the summit of Mount Washington and probably other high summits and high peaks in New England. Um, many birds on migration are actually going to be um, flying at night um, between you know, 3,000 and 7,000 feet. So it's very likely that they're kind of coming around Mount Washington and other, other nearby peaks, um, it, you know, naturally on migration. And uh, because of the work of the weather observers, uh, they get to be up there during migration and they will often, you know, hear sounds during peak migration and go to the window and see birds sitting there. And so the image on the right, the, the four birds uh, that are pictured here on the right hand side of this image, they were all, uh, these are photos taken in one night um, last fall actually um, in October. And you see up, up top there, yellow bellied sapsucker, down below you have um, both kinglets, the ruby crowned kinglet in the middle left and the golden crowned kinglet on the right. And in the lower middle you have the um, uh, brown creeper. So these are birds um, that will, uh, in the case of the ruby crown kinglet and uh, sapsucker, will actually do um, kind of a, a longer migration down into the mid-Atlantic, but um, the creepers and the golden crown kinglets will do um, a little bit of a shorter distance migration, but they will nevertheless move in number um, in the fall and in the spring. And so we get them coming up to the summit of um, on the upper left, this is a spring image from a couple years ago. This is a an adult male um, yellow-bellied sapsucker in the breeding plumage, um, hanging on to some rye mice, looking out about the same window pictured um, on the right here. So on the uh, upper left, it's a yellow-bellied sapsucker that kind of you know got stuck got stuck in the in a storm and it's just riding it out. Um, not so much in a storm, but in the lower left, it's a, a picture from the. Um, I think it was uh, sep late September from 2014, I believe it was, was a uh, saw wet owl that hung out on the summit, actually out on the state park rotunda window and was there all day roosting. Um, so that was a pretty incredible find that one of the weather observers noticed, hey, there's an owl out here. And this one um, got garnered a lot of uh, attention on social media. So it's pretty cool to be up in the mountains and um, above tree line and see birds that don't exactly belong there. But on migration, you know, anything's possible. And that's what's really exciting um, about this landscape, but also everywhere um, uh, uh, during the migration period. So um, 
it's a this you know being late April and into May. It's an exciting time to to be a birder. So as you move down um, into the lower elevations, so between 4,500 feet and 2,500 feet, you get the the boreal forest, the conifer forest. Um, of black, red, and white spruce, balsam fir, yellow birch, tamarack, um, lots of breeding resident birds and eruptive migrants in um, certain winters. Uh, there are some really classic species that everyone wants to try to see, like the Bicknell's thrush, blackback woodpecker, spruce grouse, boreal chickadee, and in some winters, um, even birds like pine grosbeak. So the tree line at 4,500 feet, um, it's uh, one of the lowest tree lines in the United States because we do get such strong prevailing west winds. Um, we get uh, incredible windstorms. You know, they, the, the weather observers will say that on Mount Washington that we'll get wind gusts to 100 miles an hour every two days in winter. So from mid October to essentially mid May, you'll be getting winds. Um, to 100 miles an hour pretty much every, I did say every other day, but actually it's probably more like every three or four days, but winds gusting to hurricane force, it's about uh, 73 miles an hour um, every other day. So that wind takes its toll and it really batters that boreal forest up at um, tree line. And you get these really uh, uniquely stunted trees that are essentially completely barren of their vegetation on one side and we call that krumholz which is german for twisted wood and those dwarf krumholz forests are visible on the mount washington auto road where i took this photo just around 4500 feet um, and uh, you get these incredible forests and at tree line i have noticed um there are certain birds that come around uh, that in, in the case of this particular species, the, the Canada jay, formerly the gray jay, although it goes by many names, these birds um, on these high peaks of the White Mountains and elsewhere in the United States too, but especially in the White Mountains uh, tree line, you get the, the, the gray jays, the Canada jays, uh, coming around and looking looking to you for, for a food handout. Um, this was on Mount Jackson, so not quite Mount Washington. Mount Washington's hidden in the clouds in the distance in this photo. Um, but you get a number of other species that, you know, it could be because you're at tree line, essentially you're at the, the canopy level, you have a, a much better chance of seeing some of these birds that do like to sit out exposed. In the case of the uh, bird in the middle right, the New Hampshire state bird, the purple finch, um, you often get them sitting, you know, teed up on the top of these trees singing, um, which, is, which is pretty exciting. Um, but you also have, uh, you know, other other birds like the white um, white throated sparrow in the uh, upper left. We'll uh, we'll play this song because this is this is a a kind of a classic uh, boreal forest song. You'll start hearing it now in the lower elevations as these birds migrate through. But uh, let me play this song and see if you recognize it. Yeah, so it's just that piercing whistle. Um, we'll play a, another version on it. So the one I just played was from uh, Quebec, recorded in May to, uh, 2018. And I'm referencing these songs from allaboutbirds.org, which is a great resource for learning a uh, bird song. So we'll play one uh, recorded in July in New York. And that, to me, the song I just played is more of the classic kind of um, white-throated sparrow uh, song. So that is, when I hear that, I'm just teleported back to any time I'm hiking in the White Mountains. Um, you also have in the, the lower right, um, uh, the dark-eyed junco, a ground-nesting bird that is very much at home um, in the Alp in the subalpine, the tree-line zone of Mount Washington. You'll also get them on, you know, calmer weather days in, in the in the summer season up above tree line up in the alpine zone as well. Other birds include um, upper right the uh, white wing crossbill, um, really unique colorful bird that's actually here year round um, but you'll get them in the boreal forest uh, as well as the um, American uh, goldfinch, yellow rumped warbler in the um, uh, center 
middle ear, uh, bottom row, and then just another advantage of that uh, Canada J that's taking some food, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So the the boreal forest is you know not just uh, not just the tree line. Um, although uh, we'll we'll talk about a couple other kind of subsets of this ecology in um, just a moment, but th this is one of the species, the bicknells thrush, that a lot of people travel to um, the the alpine zone, especially the tree line, to see. So bicknells thrush um, was for a, uh, for a while considered to be uh, you know, kind of a subset population of the gray cheek thrush, but it's its own species, really limited in geographic um, distribution. This is a bird of Southeast Canada and uh, Northern New England, Northern uh, upstate New York, that just breeds kind of in a, in a, a, a ribbon of, of, of a unique landscape above basically 2,500 feet up in these dense alpine, um, spruce fir for us and um, we'll play this song for you it's just a really unique um, kind of jazzy uh, uh, vocalization and this is a bird that if you if you hear this song um, just know that you know you're in the presence of of a, of a, a rare unique exciting bird And I'll play a couple call notes as well, because they're often going to be giving these calls um, at Treeline. It's, it's good to, to listen. So they're kind of making a call. It's like they're saying veer, but it's uh, it, it has that really unique ring to it that's reminiscent of the song itself. Just an incredible um, vocalization. All right, so. These are some of the birds that I think of when I really think of the of the boreal forest. When I think of hiking through the the dense, you know, spruce fir landscape of the White Mountains. So quite a lot here to unpack, but um, we'll we'll go through kind of one by one. So in the uh, lower left here, this is the blue-headed vireo. So this is a bird that's just starting to come into. Um, New England in the last uh, couple weeks. Um, this is a kind of a, an earlier migrant compared to, you know, compared to the what I think of as peak migration in mid-May. This is a bird that's going to start, that has started arriving usually the last two weeks in April. So the lower left there, you see it's um, kind of steely uh, blue-gray head in this image, but with those white spectacles. Um, a, a, a cute bird. In the um, middle left here with this kind of greenish sheen here, this is the yellow-bellied flycatcher, um, a, a flycatcher, you know, related to our eastern Phoebe that is um, just has this beautiful kind of yellow green plumage uh, that you're going to get in the in the boreal forest. We also have that black bull warbler upper left here that uh, I talked about a little while um, earlier, and uh, I wanna I wanna play um, the Black Pole song. Um, let's see if I can uh, pull that one up because this is an incredible um, incredible song, and uh, it's it's very insect like. So I'm gonna play it for us. And if you're in the White Mountains and you hear this song, I don't know that it's uh, I find that it's hard to find this bird. It sings and you, and you can hear this song, um, but it's not always gonna be easy to find it. But let's, let's see if we can, we can listen to it. So it's very high pitched, but it's kind of that, it's kind of um, on the same note. It, it, in a way, it reminds me of like a siren coming at you and then and then um, fading away. Like this, there's a Doppler effect to it. So I'll play it again. It comes kind of comes at you and then it fades away. And so that's a sound that you're going to hear in that dense. Um, 
uh, alpine to subalpine um, and boreal forest uh, spruce fir. So it's really, um, you know, it's not a glamorous song, but it's an incredibly stunning uh, bird, and uh, it's one of my favorites in the in the um, in the boreal forest. Up top, um, kind of middle left, you have the boreal chickadee. Again, one of those species that people are that people like to try to see. Um, you have the uh, ruby crown kinglet in the. Um, uh, to the right of the chickadee there with just a hint of its little red crown showing another early um, migrant. This is actually already started coming into uh, Maine and New Hampshire oh, in the last two weeks or so. Another early migrant to the right is uh, the winter wren, um, which also makes a, a pretty uh, astounding song. Um, so let's see if we can uh, get this guy out and uh, We'll, we'll play him just a burst of notes um, with this one. Really fun to hear uh, to hear when you're on a hike. Yeah, so when you're out and you hear this bird, it's it's just an explosion of notes. Um, hard bird to see. They're very quick. They're very mouse-like. They like to hop around and kind of um, in these like kind of jerky motions. They have this, their tail stuck up. They're just, they've got a lot of attitude. Um, and I just love that song. Um, in the middle uh, here, yellow, black, gray. Uh, this is the magnolia warbler, um, another warbler that's breeding in the, in the, um, the boreal forest. To its right, we have Swainson's thrush. So not the Bicknell's thrush, but the the another boreal thrush um, that is characterized by again these kind of like it's wearing glasses, similar to the blue-headed vireo, kind of um, whitish in this image. But it has generally when you're out and you see this bird, it kind of has a yellow wash to its face um, that kind of uh, that kind of overtops reddish grayish speckling over a white belly um, just another great bird to see uh, in the alpine in the in the boreal forest um, and you'll get this on migration too uh, this is a bird that that you know has to travel through other landscapes before it gets to where it's breeding so it's um it's another uh, bird you can see on migration um, a bird that I don't always think of as exclusively boreal is the um, red-breasted nuthatch, the smaller of our two nuthatches that we have along with the white-breasted. But the red-breasted nuthatch is more of the um, mixed boreal uh, forest species. Uh, really cute, charismatic bird I, uh, with their little kind of tin horn call notes. I really like to see them and, and listen to them uh, when I'm on a hike. Uh, but going down the, the, the three below, we have uh, spruce grouse, um, a, a true boreal specialist, um, kind of the, uh, the, you know, a blue, you know, dark blue chicken of the North Woods, very famous for being virtually uh, unafraid of people, just like incredible to see this bird um, in the landscape. This image I took uh, actually near Moosehead Lake last fall and this bird was strutting its stuff. It was with a group of females. This male was very quickly going through the motions of all its different displays and it was really fun to see and we um, got off some photos of it doing these different uh, different struts and it was a really exciting moment. So if you're in the in the mountains and you see you know chicken like bird walking around doesn't seem to be afraid of you. It's got this jet black and gray um, plumage, you're probably going to be seeing a, a, spruce, a spruce grouse there. And then to its left, you have the morning warbler, um, one of my favorite warblers. Hard to see. They love to hang out in dense undergrowth, um, but they make a haunting kind of a churry, churry, churry call. Um, when you're when you're out there, they kind of stick to more of um as I said dense undergrowth, kind of a little bit wetter undergrowth, uh, not so much probably in the alp in the kind of subalpine um, boreal forest, but more along maybe boreal uh, stream sides and places again with the kind of the um, 
uh, viburnum type undergrowth, places where these birds can hide out well. And um, just to the left of it, one of my favorite sparrows is Lincoln Sparrow. Uh, this is a bird that's probably not as likely to be found breeding in the White Mountains, but it's definitely here on migration and it's and its breeding grounds are boreal bogs uh, a bit further north into Canada. But you know there there probably are um, instances of this bird breeding um, around uh, our area, but it's one of my favorites. It just has this incredibly delicate streaking on its um, chest with uh, notes of of um, tan and gray and reddish and brownish on its face. One of my favorite, just so, such a handsome sparrow. So many of these birds are birds that um, either call the boreal forest home exclusively or can be found moving through. Um, when you're on a, a hike and you see something like this, it's just such a special um, occasion. So Along with the kind of the more traditional mountainside boreal forest, there are opportunities to see other boreal um, ecologies, places like um, bogs that have a lot of um, thick black spruce um, stands. And these are places that actually have um, a couple bird species that are more or less not endemic, but really prefer these locations to breed. One of them is the olive-sided flycatcher, and that's the bird in the upper right. It's, uh, you know, larger than our, our Phoebe. This is a bird that's, um, it has this really unique plumage, almost looks like it's wearing a little um, gray vest over a kind of yellow-white um, uh, body there, and uh, it has a very, um, piercing song so we're gonna we're gonna play the song and uh if you recognize it then maybe that means you've uh you've gone through one of these um unique natural landscapes while hiking in the white mountains so it's almost like it's saying quick three beers and that's how i remembered um when I kind of first first learning about this bird, uh, but they are they're found you know more or less kind of everywhere on migration, but on their breeding grounds in uh, late May um, into August, you'll see them in these kind of more impenetrable boreal bogs. This photo on the left, by the way, um, I took at Church Pond Bog off of the Ken Camagas Highway. So this is a great little. Um, in and out trail uh, that's can be buggy um, with the black flies and mosquitoes, but it's an excellent place to see this bird on um, breeding grounds. It's also one of the um, few places you'll get the bird in the lower right, the palm warbler on breeding grounds. This is a bird that um, also breeds in these boreal bogs, but are mostly restricted to much further north. Um, but this is a good place for this one. And I mentioned Lincoln Sparrow, you know, um, I haven't heard Lincoln Sparrow when I've been visiting this location, but this is the kind of uh, landscape you'd get the Lincolns. Um, you could also get black-backed woodpecker, which is another kind of unique boreal bird um, that uh, loves these thick uh, black spruce stands, especially where those black spruce are dying back. Um, maybe they've been infected by spruce budworm and they're going through kind of a decline. This is a bird that loves to um, get in there and uh, pick at the bark and flake the bark off um, to get at those uh, those insects. And uh, let's see, there's one more species. This is the swamp sparrow. Um, you know, more of a generalist, not restricted to the boreal bogs. You'll get them down even at brownfield bog. Um, we get them, um, but they're they're also a, a common um, bird in this kind of landscape. So that's that's a, a nice kind of um, buffet of color uh, uh, for this landscape. So I mentioned the spruce, the spruce budworm outbreaks. So um, this is a, a, the budworm is the larval stage of a moth um, that infects the, um, the spruce trees of these, you know, 
you know, more homogenous stands of, of spruce that can be quite devastating economically to the logging operations of uh, northern New England and to southeast Canada. Having said that, um, this bonanza of budworms that are created by the outbreak um, can be a boon for a number of boreal specialist warblers, including the Cape May warbler in the lower left, the bay breasted warbler in the middle, lower middle, and the Tennessee warbler in the lower right. So these are birds that 30 years ago, you probably wouldn't see them that much, but due to this um, outbreak in the last several years of uh, the spruce budworm in Southeast Canada, these species have really ballooned up. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, it's, bittersweet that um, that these birds are uh, in big numbers right now because it does mean that um, that the uh, the spruce are getting attacked but it's it's natural and um, over time this this you know scourge will will move somewhere else and sadly we'll uh, probably not see as many of these species but we'll take them while we can get them um, and it's exciting to to have them when we when we have them so as you move uh, further down in elevation, you get into the more of that colorful fall foliage zone, the, uh, the landscape below 2,500 feet, the mixed deciduous forest uh, that produce a lot of seed and fruit bearing um, species of trees like the oaks, the beeches, um, red, uh, uh, gr gray birch, white pine, and many breeding resident birds. Um, breeding migrants and eruptive migrants as well. Um, so I took all these photos in the lower right, um, boreal or barred owl is a common predator in this environment. Um, to the right of the barred owl, we have a female black-throated blue warbler. Um, and then below that, we have the more deciduous uh, uh, counterpart to the, the boreal red-breasted nuthatch. We have the white-breasted nuthatch. And then a very colorful member of the um, deciduous forest, we have the scarlet tanager. So these are just a, a handful of birds you might find in the mixed deciduous landscapes of New Hampshire and the White Mountains. A number of other species include the wood thrush in the upper left, one of my favorites just with the striking black spots um, on its chest with kind of that uh, brick red um, uh, cap and back. So it's uh, an incredible bird. Um, uh, ooh, let's go forward here. Incredible bird to um, to have around and uh, we'll play our, our wood thrush um, song so we can we can get a flavor of the of the deciduous forest. So just a series of really kind of complex phrases that almost like it's trying to tell a story. Uh, I just love hearing this bird when it's uh, not just on migration, but on the breeding grounds and the mixed deciduous forest. Um, in addition to the uh, wood thrush, of course, in the lower left, we have the red-eyed vireo, a bird that's constantly singing in the summertime from the canopy of the deciduous forest. It's also singing in phrases a bit faster than the uh, wood thrush, but let's listen to this one song. Yeah, so you'll hear this in the heat of the summer um, from the treetops, and this is a, a very common bird of the lower elevations. Um, in the left middle, of course, we have our ruffed grouse. And when we're out in the woods, sometimes we'll hear the, the sound of the ruffed grouse displaying. So this is what this one sounds like. So this is actually the sound of the, the, the drumming is the sound that the wings make as it's beating them against, as a male is beating them against its chest, often on a log, perhaps even on a hollow log to help to augment that sound. Um, but that can be uh, quite a funny um, 
experience. You almost feel it in your chest when you're out hiking. Um, but just know that it's a, a rough grouse trying to drum up some support for the for the springtime romance. Um, just to the right, we mentioned our, our yellow-bellied sapsucker. And if you're out in the woods and you um, you come across a tree that has a bunch of holes in it, little holes, I'm talking about, you know, quarter of an inch just in a, in a complete kind of line in rows, that's very, um, very likely you're, you're seeing the, uh, the work of a, a yellow-bellied sapsucker that's digging these, <laughs> drilling these um, wells to then fill up with sap and catch insects with, uh, with that sap, and then they'll come around and get those insects. Um, Above, up, upper right, we have the uh, golden crowned kinglet, a bird that you can get in the mixed conifer forests as well, but you'll get them um, in the uh, mixed deciduous and conifer forests and the hemlock forests of uh, lower elevations. Really tiny, really um, cute, high pitched, tinkling calls. Um, one of my favorites uh, to see. And then the lower right, we have the broad winged hawk. Um, just a, a classic for a uh, uh, breeding migrant from South America that's here now, um, has been here for about uh, a week and a half to two weeks, um, and they'll be here through through the fall before they head back south again. So um, it's just a, it's just a, a ni another nice bird to see. So um, Let's see, we've got black-throated blue warbler. I always like throwing this bird in. It's the kind of the, the, uh, the symbol, the mascot of Tin Mountain Conservation Center, which in itself is a, it's a great um, deciduous forest landscape. It's, it's a bit on the drier sides. So you do have, um, you, you do have some uh, trees like um, the, pitch pines and, and uh, white pine areas of parts of Albany that are more affected by that really unique kind of dry uh, soil type, which comes with it a, a bunch of different plants um, and different birds that, uh, that you can see closer to the, the southern end of the, the Mount Washington Valley. But you also have um, mountain laurel, a really um, thick, uh, growing shrub that is a perfect nesting location for the black-throated blue warblers um, in in that part of the world. As you go further north, of course, you have um, some of the viburnums and um, uh, what we would call um, uh, moose moose maple. Some of these larger leaf trees that um, that the moose like to feed on. Um, but uh, the lower understory there, you have again these thick. Uh, plants that are perfect for the black-throated blue warbler. So we've got, um, let's see, we'll get, uh, we'll get this guy on, um, on recording here. So when I think of black-throated blue, I think of, uh, I think kind of like it's saying, beer, 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 please, which is, you know, uh, it's what I hear, but you might hear something else. Yeah, so another unique sound of the uh, the northern hardwood deciduous forest. So a great bird to, to have around. When you're out in the deciduous forest, it's important to kind of take note that, you know, you're, you're in a landscape with many levels and you've got different birds feeding in different parts of the forest in different um, levels of the canopy. You know, you've got um, birds like this, Blackburnian warbler, that are often up in the tops of the trees and then maybe working their way up and down the trunks. You've got black and white warblers. And down on the ground, you've got different species too. You've got birds like this oven bird. Going back to the top, we mentioned our Cape May warbler. Well, on migration and up in the, uh, the boreal north where they breed, they really like to be at the tops of the trees. So another uh, neck breaker to, to see this bird. But you also have, um, Further down, you've got American red starts, and then down on the ground, you might have um, the different water thrushes. We have both uh, the northern water thrush and the Louisiana water thrush, which, as their name implies, really are drawn to um, stream sides in the woods, so you get them a bit further down in elevation. Um, uh, 
especially the uh, further down towards the bottom of the valley, um, you have the Louisiana water thrush, which is a more of a southeastern nesting species of water thrush. Um, and then the northern water thrush, you get all the way up into Canada. So many of these warblers um, in all their color and all their vocal um, beauty are found at varying levels of the of the of the forest structure. So it's really important when you're walking, if you're interested in doing some birding, don't just look in front of you or on the ground. Take a look up into the trees as well, because you're you're bound to see um, a number of different species. So getting into the open lands, kind of um, along with the alpine zone, kind of a, a limited um, type of landscape that we have, but we do have it. Um, this includes the pastures and orchards and maybe blueberry barrens as well and power line cuts. You've got a lot of shrubs and grasses, sedges, and what we call edge habitats that kind of are in between the forest and the field. Um, many seed producing plants uh, that are really great for um, buntings, for instance, the, the indigo bunting pictured in the, um, on the right hand side here, this strikingly blue um, uh, songbird. And you have American kestrels, really colorful small falcon that we have, and bobolinks in the lower left here, a specialist that's a specialist on, uh, on uh, rice, uh, their Latin name means rice eater. Um, they, they are often found, at least in their wintering grounds in rice fields, um, but they love these open landscapes um, in New England. And then birds like the barn swallow and insect eater that are very much at home in the farm fields of, uh, of the White Mountains, um, but also uh, much further west as well. So I, I threw in a number of species in this uh, slide that you can find kind of in your backyards, but but I, you know, I put them together with these open landscapes because they're also edge habitat birds. They're birds that do like to have um, lawn and, uh, you know, cut grass, you know, birds like our robins and our song sparrows, robins in the middle of this um, image and the song sparrow in the upper left. Um, birds like our blue jays and the uh, on the left here and the gray cat birds on the lower right. These are birds that, you know, like some open spaces, but are, um, in the case of the cat bird, really interested in dense thickets as well. Um, birds like our cedar waxwing in the in the uh, right hand middle. These are birds that are, you know, love to go from fruit tree to fruit tree in massive flocks. You'll get them throughout the boreal forest and the deciduous forest, but in a field, you know, you might be more apt to see them flying in a big flock. So I put them in this uh, this image. Birds like our killdeer in the upper right. This is um, a, a sandpiper, a plover um, that is actually very much at home in, um, in, in large fields in the White Mountains, uh, especially over towards Whitefield and the Whitefield Airport, you get them uh, over there. Hawks, you know, you'll get a lot of hawks in this environment. Um, the red-tailed hawk is the one I chose for this because um, they do like to go after, you know, rabbits and squirrels and other game that they can see in some of these open landscapes. Um, but also uh, bird-eating hawks, uh, and falcons like the merlin in the lower center um, here that love to go after birds like the cedar, like the cedar waxwings. And then finally on the lower left you have um, a woodpecker that's very much at home on the ground, the northern flicker, which is um, an, a, another colorful, uh, stunning bird that we love to see um, on migration, but also on breeding grounds um, here in uh, the White Mountains. Bobolink, um, this is a bird that nests throughout the northern tier of the United States in those open lands, um, but their their breeding range is quite restricted down in um, central uh, South America in uh, open landscapes, um, farming landscapes, unfortunately, where they're considered a pest. So um, this is a bird that's in, uh, that's in decline, and um, it's important that we help to maintain some of those farm um, environments and open land environments for birds like this. And uh, kind of starting to wrap this up, so we're, you know, all these landscapes also have water in them, you know, whenever it's Whenever it rains, the rain pools and forms 
um, ponds and lakes and, and uh, moving water in, in streams and rivers. And so this comes with a whole suite of water tolerant tree and shrub species um, and the birds that depend on them, birds like osprey, red-winged blackbird, kingfisher, wood duck. Um, and so it's, a, it, it's a, another just really unique environment that we have um, in central New Hampshire that's a, a good place to find some unique birds, like in the upper left here, the marsh wren. Um, uh, a really uh, stunning little wren, you know, structurally similar to the uh, the winter wren that stalks around, uh, but stalks around the uh, the marshes. We have eastern phoebes, a bird that you can get in urban environments too, and in the mountains, but um, are perfectly at home in um, in wetlands and marshes, hawking uh, insects. That's the bird in the uh, upper middle here. We also have the hooded merganser, a bird that, a duck that will, um, diving duck that will live in um, wooded ponds in the White Mountains, along with the wood duck as well. And both are cavity nesting ducks. Um, so you'll find them in, in, you know, secluded ponds in the White Mountains. And then you also have um, spotted sandpiper in the middle left here that's breeding in the White Mountains and ponds. Um, Viri is the, is the thrush in the lower left here. I put that in here because although they don't breed in specifically to wetlands, they, um, they do like riverside forests of lower elevation. So that's a bird that you'll get um, lower down. And then in more of the, the thick wetlands, I put in the bittern. And a uh, bittern is another one of those kind of haunting, um, haunting, booming sounds. So it's uh, when it's making this call that I, this song that I'm going to share with you, just, just think of, um, think of this bird. It's actually pulling air into kind of an air sac in its throat um, in the first couple sounds that you'll hear is actually the, the sound of the, the bird opening and closing its mouth and forcing air into the sac and then releasing the air in a, in a series of, of kind of guttural sounds. Um, it just sounds really incredible booming that you'll hear in the marshes of, uh, of the White Mountains. And I've, uh, I've tried my best actually up at Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge um, to, uh, to try to mimic this bird by basically saying, um, kakum. and if you repeat that phrase a couple times, I found that the, the bitterns will actually, if they're nearby, will actually kind of come out and look at you because they might think that you're a potential uh, rival for the other bitterns in the area that this one is uh, trying to, you know, be romantic with. So it's actually kind of fun sometimes to to see if you can, you can get a bittern to think you're another other bittern and um, I had a bittern kind of flare these like uh, shoulder white shoulder patches that it had and it was stalking around this area nearby when I was making this call. Um, you know it's funny sometimes to, 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 to see what these birds will do although it's um, something you should seldom do especially during the breeding and the nestling season when they're spending all their energy on feeding their young ones um, but sometimes it's interesting to see the behaviors play out when you um, when you pretend you're a rival um, and then to the right we have a um, really sweet uh, little swallow, the tree swallow, which is a cavity nesting swallow that's often found in these wetlands, especially with the uh, dead and dying um, trees uh, that have opportunities for them to, to nest, to nest in. Alrighty, so of course we can't talk about the, the, the wetland landscape without the osprey, a truly cosmopolitan species of, of hawk um, that's been uh, here in Maine for um, a number of weeks now, setting up territories and, and bringing sticks to nests. Um, but, uh, but it's a bird that, that you'll hear often before you see. So I'm gonna play the display song. So 
so a, a series of those cries you'll often hear um, preceding actually seeing the uh, the ospreys up to kind of flying higher up um, together often as a pair when they're doing their display um, display calls so that's really nice to see and then uh, of course also being in the white mountains and coming upon a secluded large pond or lake you get the common loon um, with many incredible vocalizations in their own right so i'll just play a couple of their of their songs Yeah, so very haunting, um, and uh, each each of these different vocalizations means something else. That was the whale that I just called. That's that, that I just played the haunting call that loons give back and forth to figure out each other's locations. Um, so each one of the different vocalizations um, you can listen to on sites like All About Birds and learn more about um, what these vocalizations mean. So kind of a um, a wrap up, uh, I thought it was good to share this um, first bullet here. The US Fish and Wildlife Service does have a feather atlas, um, which can be helpful uh, if you have a kind of a feather that you found out in the woods that you want to learn more about. And it breaks it down, um, it key, allows you to key out uh, different feathers based on their um, structure and, and size and that sort of thing. So that's helpful. Um, so just some reminders, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, if you're interested in keeping birds perhaps on your landscape but or just generally maybe where you work or where you go often try to get as many native plants planted around where where you live and work um, try to replace the essentially ecologically non-functional um, invasive or exotic species of plants with um, a similarly uh, perhaps a similarly flowering or similarly colored uh, fall foliage plant that is native to your area. Um, this just goes so much further to promote native insect life and therefore native bird life. Um, of course, probably keep uh, preaching to the choir, but keeping cats indoors is huge, um, limiting those um, unnecessary deaths of birds on migration and on breeding grounds. Shade-grown coffee is another um, great uh, uh, effort to look into, um, and uh, there's more, lots more information about shade-grown online. Um, and the American Bird Conservancy's uh, window collision program lots of oper well, lots of technologies in the form of decals and things to be put on your windows to uh, minimize bird strikes and then finally you know climate change is changing these landscapes that we know and love in the white mountains they're in many ways they're pushing those deciduous forests and the the conifer boreal forests further up mountainsides and actually um, isolating further those alpine landscapes. Um, and so it's important to, you know, lobby those those elected officials that work for us to um, to take charge and do more to combat um, uh, impacts of climate change. Um, and then finally here before we go back to um, our talking heads <laughs> will uh, I'll just mention some of my favorite birdie hikes in the White Mountain National Forest that are um, a great mix of um, alpine subalpine boreal um, landscapes so Old Jackson Road in Pinkham Notch, Trudeau Road in Bethlehem, Pondicherry National Wildlife Refuge in Jefferson Whitefield, Church Pond Bog off of uh, Route 112. Um, I got some of the photos of the um, Canada Jays on Mount Jackson and Mount Tom and Crawford Notch. Tuckerman Ravine Trail has many of these boreal species just from uh, the, the lot at Pinkham Notch up into um, up to Hermit Lake Shelter, even before getting to Tuckerman Ravine itself, you get a lot of these boreal species. And then um, the Caps Ridge Trail um, 
on the north side of uh, was that Jefferson. Um, that has some spectacular um, boreal uh, uh, opportunities to see boreal species. Um, so with that, I will um, stop my share here and uh, we can go back to our our faces um, and let's see if we have Oh, Lori wrote, uh, NRCS has great programs available for landowners for habitat enhancements for specific species of birds and other wildlife, so that's great. Yeah, um, like, can I, I'll, let me just add in. It, it, yeah. I just recently did this with my um, property, and I have a large field, and I was really would love to have bobolinks in my field. So I, you have to go through a number of different things. I had a wildlife uh, ecologists came and did a wildlife management plan. I don't, you either have to have a wildlife management plan or a forest management plan. Anyway, to make a long story short, the field isn't really big enough to enhance for, for bobolinks, but there was a ton of other stuff that um, I could do. So if you're a landowner and um, you're interested in that kind of stuff, it's a great program. They, uh, it's a cost sharing. You have to put in a little bit, but you get a fair amount of money from the government to do anything from plantings to <laughs> delayed mowing to invasive species removal, um, all kinds of different things. We've used it extensively at Tin Mountain for a lot of different programs. And so I thought, well, I'm going to check into doing it on my own property. And it's been great. It's just been a great learning experience. And, uh, I just really uh, think it's a it's a great tool for a lot of people. So I'd encourage people to to check into that. And RCS right down in Conway is our local uh, our local spot. Deb Marnage and Nels Linda Thaw can never say his last name, but good old Nels. <laughs> so that's great. Thanks, Lori. Mm -hmm. Um, so looking at the chat here, Katie asks, "What's your favorite type of habitat to hike in for birding?" Um, well, I love being able to go through, well, the, the kind of two answers. I do really like um, locations that give you a variety of, of uh, natural habitats. So walking from Pinkham Notch, for instance, up the old Jackson Road, you, you gain something like 1200 feet in elevation and it just happens to straddle the northern hardwood forest and the, the conifer boreal for us. So you get this really cool transition between the two landscapes and you can kind of get a sense for what what changes and what's um, kind of present at the bottom of the hike or walk um, and, and absent towards the top and vice versa. So that's really cool. But another answer is, um, especially on migration, it's really fun to go to different river valleys. So this is a, a plug for the walk. Uh, that's the series of walks that are coming up both at Brownfield Bog, but but even more um, exciting sometimes is the um, the the landscape around uh, the 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 trails off of the Valley Crossroad in Jackson. You know, as birds are flying um, north in spring during the day when they all kind of come down to rest and feed, many of them are kind of naturally along um, river valleys. And that can be very exciting place to go and check to see what's around, what's migrating through. And um, this can be some of the best, you know, surprising um, places to find stuff. So like a couple springs ago, I was with a group at that location. We had a redhead woodpecker fly over, which was, a, it's a bird that's just now kind of getting into Southern New Hampshire breeding, um, or at least theoretically breeding, but it's a bird of the mid-Atlantic that um, did not expect to be, to be there. And so you often get in springtime this, uh, this, um, overshooting effect where birds have migrated the night before um, and they've gone too far north. They, they don't mean to fly, let's say, into central or northern New Hampshire, but they, but they do. Maybe the weather, um, the meteorological conditions push them further north than where they meant to be. And so in, this, in the early morning, you will get these reorienting 
birds uh, like that red-headed woodpecker that are flying south, you know, that are heading back down to get to the route that they meant to be on. So um, that's why birding in the early morning, usually between, um, at least in, in from now through first week of June, uh, you know, from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. can be some of the best birding of the day uh, because these birds are, um, many of them are, are, you know, pretty exhausted from, from um, their flight. So they're, they're feeding actively or maybe they are on their breeding territory and they're singing. So you can get a sense of what they are just by what's singing. Um, but the morning can be really exciting, especially as the, the sun's coming up, maybe the insects aren't quite active yet. Um, but then, you know, a, a tree might light up in the sun and the insects are going and then the birds just find it and it can be a bonanza of, uh, of activity. So early morning is exciting. And then, you know, as I said, those little river valleys can be really fun places to be. Well, I don't see any other questions on the chat. Did anybody have, you feel free to unmute yourself and you could ask your question directly. Katie, I was wondering if maybe you could tell us about the Bird Society potluck coming up. Sure. Um, so we have uh, kind of since COVID was really going, fallen off a little bit with our, our Tin Mountain Bird Society, but um, we're going to be starting back up some some kind of regular meetings. And so next Tuesday at 530, we're going to have a potluck in person at Tin Mountain. And we're going to discuss a couple of different things, some of the upcoming bird events with Tin Mountain. Um, and also our efforts to build a modus tower on our nature center property, which is this, I mean, if you want more details, you can come to the potluck, but basically it's this wildlife track tracking system. That's a, a multi-continent effort to kind of uh, almost revolutionize the way that we're studying migration ecology and birds and things that were typically up until now kind of too small to attach any kind of transmitters on. So um, that's a pretty exciting thing. Um, so yes, 5.30 next Tuesday, if anyone is interested in learning more about all of that. And then I think there was one more question in the chat. Oh, yeah. Um, Lori and Frank asked, I've heard more whippoorwills. Are they making a comeback? That's a great oh. question. Um, uh, I'm not sure if they're making a comeback. Maybe someone else on the um, presentation knows more about them than I do, but I know that they are... They do well in kind of the, the central part of the state that's a bit drier, that's a bit more um, like the sand plains of, of parts of uh, the southern part of the valley. Uh, whippoorwills seem to like those open forest lands. Um, and they they seem to be doing pretty well, at least in, in southern western Maine and those parts of New Hampshire that, that have that kind of environment. Um, but it's great to hear that you've got whippoorwills. We've had we've had whippoorwills for a uh, whippoorwill for years here on Davis Hill in Santa Conway. Um, it was here before things were developed, and the development made it shift its ground. But we have heard it uh, probably for about eight years now. Oh, great! We haven't heard it yet this year, but it was right across from our house until they built a house over there. Yeah. The development is driving them out because they're, of course, ground nesters. Cool. Thanks, Marvin. Marvin, I was just saying to Tom that we usually hear a whippoorwill up there, and we live on Davis Hill, too. <laughs> oh, good. I'm so, glad it's still here. <laughs> yes. Haven't heard him yet this year, though, I will, I will say. We'll be looking. Freiburg Airport. That's where I've heard him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Oh, what is Charlie says? I have some <laughs> whip input. Well, feel free to hop on there, Charlie. Okay, good. Hi, well, good to see you. Great job as usual, Laurie. <clears throat> I think the whippoorwills. I do do. Um, took over about three years ago. Whippoorwill survey route, which are they have them throughout the state. And um, let me just. I can maybe get my uh, video on here. Uh, yeah. I've been through the state and uh, I do the one down it goes around basically around Silver Lake and it's I'd say the whippoorwills are 
not doing great, but probably holding their own in this, what I'll call the Pine Barrens area of Ossipi, Madison in, in, in that area. Um, as Laurie said, it's really good uh, with Willis over uh, in that sort of Pine Barren area of uh, south of Freiburg in the Brownfield area. And, uh, you know, maybe this year, Laurie, we could do a pop-up. Yeah, would love to do that, yes. Nighthawks and the Whippoorwills uh, on it. They've been very successful the last several years. Yeah. Uh, so the Whippoorwills are threatened. I also do the uh, Common Nighthawk survey. I've done that for several, four or five years now. And, and we do have Common Nighthawks here uh, nesting successfully for the last several years on top of black cat. I don't, I don't, we're looking for the nest in that, but uh, we've been doing the surveys there. So they fit into that very similar category uh, as do the uh, whippoorwills and that on it. So you look look for them in dry sort of forest edge type things with that again, that would go with that pine barren habitat. Great, thank you, Charlie. Yeah, yes, and I would love to do the pop-up night hawk. Sure. More than happy, maybe sometime in, you know, early to mid -term. Early, yeah. Okay, maybe. perfect. Great. Cool. Any other questions? Well, that was terrific. I got to tell you, it was a good kind of refresher across the board of what's coming our way. And uh, great to hear some bird songs. Just get that part of your brain working again. And uh, anyway, but uh, thank you very much. We appreciate that. And Will is uh, leading the bird walk of the Brownfield Bog on May 14th for those of you who would like to join us then. Um, I will say we're competing with ourselves that day. We also have a series of programs in the North Country, which is sponsored by the Tilton Foundation and the Glen House in, uh, up in uh, Gorham. And um, we that day are hosting a bird walk at Moose Brook State Park, which is another awesome place to go birding uh, as well. That's a beautiful, beautiful park. Um, that also has great wildflowers. Um, so did I mention there was a wildflower walk on Monday? I didn't, did I, in the beginning? There just happens to be a pop-up wildflower walk on Monday afternoon. Um, and we will be going, co-sponsored with the Land Trust. And we are looking at two, a floodplain forest and then Humphreys Ledge, looking at two really enriched sites and comparing the two. It's at one o'clock. I will say that the, the floodplain forest, easy walking, no problem. The walk into Humphreys is you need to, have, it's moderately strenuous, need to be in some good hiking shape to get in there, but beautiful Dutchman's bridges, all kinds of very interesting uh, plants. You do need to sign up online for that. So go ahead and go on our website. I can't believe I forgot to say that. I'm leading that program. <laughs> Just say anyway. it at the end, folks will remember yes. it. There you go. So anyway. All right. Well, I guess that's it, guys. Let's keep our eyes open for cool birds and uh, hope that uh, some people will join us at the uh, potluck on Tuesday night. Thanks, Will. All right. Thanks, thank all. You. Take thank care. You. Good night, Good to see you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks for coming, Jean. Good to and see Lori, you. Lori, Lori, before you go, what's the what's the Sarah who got the PhD's last name? My daughter. Oh, I, I, I can't remember. Okay. Um, uh, I'll think about it. I'll, if you I think of it, it's oh, yeah. oh, and I'll let you know. Sarah's laughing. Thank you. This All is right, great. great. Thank you, Will. Yeah, good to Thank see you, you guys. Good good show, Will. Will. Hi. Yep. Thank you, Frank. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marvin. Thank, yep. Thanks, Will. Yep. yep. Thanks, Charlie. Good All to right. see you. Yep. So. Anyway, nice job, Will. That was great. I really yeah. What do you think? I mean, that was a whole. I different, did. I liked uh, it a lot. I, I love that kind of preview. I was just guessing the whole time. Oh, like oh, I was just doing all right. I gotta say, then I just kind of forget some like you know I don't know what am I forgetting? Fly catchers. I can't ever forget. That. I know. I should. We should just have a fly catcher program, but <laughs> you know, that would, it wouldn't. It wouldn't fit an hour. You'd have to get real deep or something. Yeah. Yeah. But. So. We'll, we'll um, do that in the field. Okay. Yeah, no, that was, uh, I thought that was, uh, that was great. And I can tell you, I really appreciate your end slide and pushing climate change and anything. I mean, it's just got to be in people's faces and people have to realize that any, anything you do to, can help. So I think yes. all those things are good. Hi, Howie and Sue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's good to, good to have Howie and Sue here. They've been, yeah. on, they've been on a global tour. Yeah. 
Um, I threw that birding one in for them too, because that's right in their backyard. Oh, right. So they're right there. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been to Moose Brooks? Hey, there, oh, he is. there he is. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. How are yeah. you? I'm good. I'm good. We're, uh, we're about to head out again. <laughs> uh, where are you going? Uh, we've got a wedding in Florida this week. Oh. So uh, I'll bring my binoculars. <laughs> yeah, do it. Awesome. 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 Huh? Well, um, yeah, well, there you go. You'll be back and it'll be the height of birding season. So, well, um, I hope the snow will be done when we get back. We yeah. have inches on the ground this morning at the house. How many? Two. Yeah. I knew there was some. I'm driving into work. There was just these giant blobs of snow on the on the road. I was like, well, it snowed somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Not, I'm not too sad it didn't snow here. So, um, anyway, but. Um, is Sue hiding there too? I haven't seen Sue. In uh, she's here. I don't know if you Hi, see. how are you? <laughs> good. good. Nice oh, to see God. you. Yes, it's good to see you too. You guys are at the top of my list for dinner. So when you get back from Florida, we'll have that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah. that'll be great. Yeah. So um, anyway. Yeah. Um, all righty. Well, have oh. a good night, everyone. And we're it. We're yeah. the holdouts. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's the after party. Yeah, exactly. I always like the after party. So, well, I will bring your syrup on May 14th. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good to see you both. Yeah. Thank yeah. You, both. you too. Take Bye. care. Thank you. See you so. Bye. Bye. Thanks.